Welcome to lecture 14 and here we continue our discussion of optimization models by looking at nonlinear applications of optimization models. First we'll go through uh, a recap of what we've looked at in chapters 12 and chapters 13. So we've used the solver model uh, by adding a new objective function decision variables and constraints to it. Uh, we've conceptually identified feasible, uh, infeasible, and unbounded solutions. An infeasible solution is where solver cannot determine the combination of decision variables that satisfies all constraints. To troubleshoot an infeasible solution, we identify which cr uh, criteria are preventing the solution from becoming feasible. And then we have choices, do nothing, and declare that we can't find a solution, or adjust constraints to create a feasible solution. An unbounded solution occurs when the feasible uh, solution is unrestrained or unlimited on some dimension. Solver attempts the maximum number of iterations without the target cell converging to an answer. Troubleshooting an unbounded solution, some of the actions we can uh, take are to add constraints to create a feasible solution. And one of the things we can do to help us find an optimal solution is loosen a constraint in order to find a feasible solution to the problem. So we can change an existing solver model by getting into the dialog box and editing our constraints or changing our objective function in the worksheet itself. Uh, we can uh, include additional decision variables um, and uh, we can produce a solution with multiple constraints. Uh, changing an infeasible solution into a feasible solution we do by adjusting constraints uh, that are used to define a solution. Uh, we can create uh, empty columns, for example, to deal with supply sor uh, shortages. We have to uh, understand policy and physical constraints and how they can affect the solution. We've looked at managing uh, transportation problems and uh, built a solver model that uses binary constraints uh, to help us with transportation problems and others as well. And of course, we make uh, widespread use of the sum product function in our activities. So we've uh, developed uh, a solution to a distribution planning problem where we have multiple, say, warehouses and multiple factories, and we have to find the most cost-effective way of shipping our goods from one source to, uh, well, from the different sources to the different destinations. So uh, we looked at the constraints that limit how to ship the goods, the need to meet demand, uh, and not to exceed capacity meet demand at the factories and not exceed capacity at the warehouses. So we identified the supply uh, at the, the warehouses, the demand at the factories. We had shipping costs from each factory, um, from each warehouse to each factory. And we used the sum product to uh, sum a series of products in the ranges where we had this data. And then we, of course, uh, entered all this information into our solver model. We also looked at assignment problems. And that's um, an optimization problem with a one-to-one -one relationship between a resource and an assignment or a job or a project task. So using binary constraints in solver to solve assignment problems um, is what we did uh, with that one-to-one -one relationship between decision variables. 
Now we're ready to go on and look at nonlinear uh, models. So a nonlinear optimization is when we have at least one term in our objective function or a constraint is nonlinear. And in this lecture, we'll examine uh, some common nonlinear uh, models, production problems when the objective function is nonlinear. And this is usually going to be the case because demand is usually a uh, demand, in, in other words, quantity is usually a function of price. And so uh, when you uh, multiply, when you get the demand uh, equation for quantity, it's going to be related to price, you know, some function of price. And then when you multiply that by price to get total revenue, you're going to get a squared function because price is part of the function for um, determining the quantity. Uh, we'll also look at... Um, how we might use a nonlinear model for locating uh, lo uh, facilities or locating equipment within a facility. And then uh, take a look at a well-known model that uh, forecasts sales or adoptions for new products. Okay, so we'll um, first look at a nonlinear uh, objective function. And if you'll recall, we're, we're going to use par uh, again. And if you'll recall that uh, par uh, is a company that makes golf products, and they've decided to move into a market for medium and high-priced golf bags. Par's distributor has agreed to buy all of the golf bags. Uh, par produces uh, a, a number of them, uh, two types, uh, standard and deluxe and that, that they're planning to build or, or manufacture. And the distributors agreed to buy all of them that they can produce of these new products. So um, we'll look at a constrained nonlinear optimization problem um, as an extension to what we looked at uh, earlier um, in Chapter 12 when we used linear uh, programming uh, to resolve or to optimize the mix of bags. So in this case we're going to consider the relationship between a price and quantity of uh, goods sold. Uh, and again as I mentioned quantity is usually going to be a function of price. The higher the price the lower the quantity demanded. So we have some function of price and when we uh, multiply quantity which is a function of price times price to get our revenue, we end up with a, a nonlinear function. Um, so in the case uh, of the par in chapter 14, they uh, derived this as the profit contribution um, with that whole idea in mind that quantity is a function of price. So we can see that we have um, nonlinear terms. <clears throat> so in formulating the um, linear programming model for the PAR problem, we assume the, uh, the company could sell all the standard and deluxe bags it could produce. Depending on the price of the uh, golf bags, we're now saying that this may not hold true. So now we're going to drop the assumption that the buyers are going to buy all of the bags we make regardless of price. So again an inverse relationship exists between price and demand as price goes up demand goes down. And so um, we've got uh, through some uh, economic uh, uh, algebra we've determined uh, and of course the book goes through how they derive this and it's fairly straightforward um, algebra and they derive this particular uh, profit contribution function 
it's quadratic, and that's a, a nonlinear function with one of its terms, one or more of its terms, uh, raised to the power of 2. And so we have both the um, quantity of the standard bag and the quantity of the deluxe bag. Some of the terms with those uh, variables are squared or raised to the power of 2. And here's our um, model, the mathematical model. We want to maximize this objective function subject to the same constraints that we had uh, in the past and that uh, we now have uh, quadratic terms in our uh, function, in our objective function. Uh, the solution to this um, nonlinear maximization problem is uh, going to be in our PAR uh, worksheet for this chapter. And we'll go on and take a look here. Um, so this figure shows um, the uh, nonlinear maximization problem. So what we end up with in a nonlinear function is instead of a line that um, is going to intersect with our uh, feasible region, we have um, nonlinear uh, geometric uh, shapes. So in this case, it's a circle, or they call it a, a contour, um, and they have different uh, profits uh, for each different contour we see. The center point um, is the highest, but that is not a feasible solution because it's outside of our feasible region. So then we try different um, profit contours, and eventually the one that's optimal we see as tangential again to our feasible region. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and take a look at the worksheet for this. Okay, so here's our uh, worksheet with the new model. And the uh, cutting and dyeing times are still the same. It's really what we uh, just uh, copied over. The constraints in terms of available hours is as it was in Chapter 12. Um, I put placeholders in of one bag uh, each, and we have total profit there of $229. Look in the uh, formula bar, though, and you can see that we are uh, we put in that quadratic function as the function for our objective function, and we want to maximize this. This is our profit function, and it's multiplying b14, which of course is our quantity, um, or C14, which again is our quantity for deluxe bags, and B14 is the quantity for standard bags, times the uh, profit per bag. So that's going to be uh, a, a, a function of the, pro the, the standard price function, which is how much revenue we get per bag, or the price per bag, in other words, what we can sell for it, minus the uh, marginal cost. Well, the marginal cost is in B9 for standard and C9 for uh, deluxe. But we're looking at B25 and B26 as the price functions. So here we see the price functions. And guess what? The price is a function of the quantity that we're trying to sell. And so we're uh, in our um, objective function, B25 is a function of B14, and we're multiplying B25 by B14. Likewise, 
for C14, it's a uh, B26 is a function of C14, and we're multiplying B26 times C14. So that's where we get the nonlinear nature of this particular problem. So we'll go up to data and solver. And here we have our constraints entered. Um, we want uh, B14. We want uh, C14. Uh, uh, also, we'll get this. We want a B19 and B22 and B19 and through B22 are the hours used um, to make uh, the particular number of standard and deluxe bags that we want. Uh, less than the uh, $C19 uh, and C22, the hours available for those. So we've got those constraints. So let's take a look at it uh, from the top. We have our objective function, which is the nonlinear uh, profit that we're going to be earning. Um, we're going to have dis uh, we're going to maximize that. Then we have our decision variables, which are the cells uh, B14 and C14. And then it's going to be subject to our uh, constraints. Again, that the uh, hours used uh, for each one of the tasks is less than the hours available. Now, the standard bag price function and the deluxe bag price function are in the model because <clears throat> they're part of the total profit uh, equation. So that's how it becomes nonlinear. And here, instead of the simplex algorithm, we're going to select the GRG nonlinear uh, algorithm. So we'll uh, go ahead and run that one. Okay, and I've got another worksheet I'm going to show you in a minute. So let, this is for the next problem. Let's go back to par. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we have, um, let's go ahead and just round these numbers to the nearest integer. Okay, so we produce um, a 460 uh, standard bags and 308 deluxe bags giving us a profit of $49,920, roughly. And we st still satisfy all the constraints, and we have slack time as we had uh, gone over in our uh, lecture in Chapter 12. Okay, let's get back to the lecture. And this is, of course, um, the uh, report. Let me let me pull that up uh, one more time. I meant to show that to you guys. Okay, so position this. Go back to here. So we have our uh, sensitivity report, and. Um, one of the things we note in the sensitivity report is um, our a Lagrangian multiplier. And a Lagrangian multiplier is like the shadow price we were looking at in the linear uh, functions of Chapter 12. And what it is basically is the rate of change of the objective function with respect to um, a change in one value of the constraint. So if we, since we have, um, let's look at the answer report here. Um, cutting and dyeing is a binding constraint. The others are not binding. So changing them by one isn't going to impact us. But since cutting and dyeing is a binding constraint, then 
changing it by one is going to um, give us uh, an, uh, our profit to increase by about $26. So we might, you know, look at perhaps um, as further business decisions, maybe hiring additional cutting and dyeing people. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, we just wanted to come up with the optimal number of bags sold, and uh, we did that 460 and 308. Okay, so um, with uh, PAR, uh, we make um, the nonlinear function are, you know, we, we uh, incorporate the uh, quantity uh, demand function into our uh, spreadsheet. And that, in turn, is uh, incorporated into how we calculate profit in our objective function. Uh, we then use a different algorithm, the GRG algorithm, rather than the simplex. Simplex for linear, GRG for nonlinear. And we uh, calculated the number of bags to be produced. And we looked at a Lagrangian multiplier, which is the equivalent conceptually of a shadow price that we had in our linear function. Okay, so now uh, let's take a look at a global, a local and global uh, optima. So uh, when we have these uh, complex functions that we might get when we're dealing with nonlinearity, it's possible that when we uh, do uh, our optimization, we're getting a local optima rather than a, an overall optima. So what that means is you'll have multiple regions where you can get something that can't be uh, increased anymore in that region, but it's not the overall uh, highest or lowest value. Um, so uh, a local maximum is a feasible solution uh, where there's no other feasible solutions in the immediate neighborhood. And a local minimum is the same except that there's no other smaller solutions in the immediate neighborhood. And so we need to uh, c come up with ways where we can look for a global optimum. That's a feasible solution where there are no other uh, feasible points um, in the entire feasible region. So again, depending on what we're doing with our optimization, we can be getting the overall maximum or the overall minimum. Overall minimum, no value in this feasible region produces a smaller value for our objective function. And uh, global maximum is where no other set of values in our feasible region produces a higher or greater um, objective function value. So uh, for um, maxima, we're usually looking at something like a, a concave uh, function. Uh, that's a function that is uh, a bowl kind of turned upside down. Uh, and we likewise, the, the maximum value uh, is the point uh, at the very top of the bowl. Uh, in general, if all the squared terms in a quadratic function have a negative coefficient and there are no covariant or cross product terms such as x times y, um, the function is going to be quadratic. We can also have, um, that's a concave function there, we can also have a convex function and a convex function 
is one that's shaped like a bowl would be uh, shaped. And um, the uh, minimal value is going to be uh, at the uh, bottom of this particular uh, shape. Uh, we can also have um, functions that produce multiple local uh, optima. And if we have, for example, trigonometric of functions in our equation, sine or cosine, it's very possible that we get hills and valleys um, and like we see in this particular diagram uh, and that shows it has a number of local minimums and local maximums and so what we have to make sure of or what we want to at least attempt uh, to get from our solver solution is the overall global maximum or the overall global minimum and not just one of these little local uh, hills or valleys that we might uh, be in. So the general strategy for doing that is to start at multiple places in our feasible region and then work from there and uh, see if they uh, converge to a uh, overall higher value. And so here we see where we have multiple starting points, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, uh, 0, 1. So we have various Cartesian uh, points that we're starting at. And then we see what solution we get um, starting there, what is the number of x and the number of y that turns the optimum. And we get the optimum objective value. And we can see we get uh, some local uh, optima that are much lower, 0.231, much lower than the global uh, maximum, which is 1.8. So um, by starting at multiple points, though, we have a better chance of finding a solution that's going to be that global um, optimum. So uh, Excel Solver does provide a uh, uh, a, an option that allows you to increase your confidence that you have found a global solution. Again, no guarantees, but you can at least improve your confidence level with it. And it's, uh, oddly enough, in the Options button with the GRG uh, tab. And we'll uh, take a look at that. Okay, so let's look at local uh, optima. So here we have a very simple uh, model. We've got our da data, uh, lower and upper bounds for them. I've plugged in 0.5 as placeholder values. Here's the function. And this one, of course, it has uh, it, it, uh, signs uh, in it. So, you know, it's got the, the uh, very strong possibility of having multiple local uh, optimums or local optimal minimums. Um, you know, the sign pattern, it, you know, does that. It just uh, follows. It, it is a repeating pattern of uh, high, low, high, low, high, low. And if you start mixing in other uh, uh, terms with it, then it can be uh, very high, or not so high, or very low, or not so low, uh, as you go through the changes. So this is our objective function. These are the decision variables. So let's look at our model for this in Solver. Um, so uh, the quantities uh, B8 and B9, which you know are the uh, decision variables, have to be less than the upper bounds, uh, which is C3 through C4. Our objective function is B12. As we've noted, we want to maximize that. 
And we're going to do that by changing our decision variables, which are B8 through B9. Of course, we choose the GRG nonlinear. Let's click the Options button. So now um, we can look at uh, GRG nonlinear, uh, click the GRG nonlinear tab in the Options dialog box, and you'll see multi start. So that's clicked. That means that we're going to um, use a uh, multiple starting points and we're going to uh, find the one, uh, uh, we're going to return the uh, x and y quantities of our decision variables for the highest optimum we find from those multiple starting points. So now let's solve it. And it's going through its uh, calculations. And we find that the um, uh, optimum is going to be 0.9x and 0.9y, giving us an objective function value of 1.8. So this is how we can handle local uh, optima, uh, multiple local optimas, and find, and, and not necessarily guarantee we find the global, but have a higher level of confidence that we have the global than if we didn't do multiple starting points. Okay, so let's uh, stop part one here, and I'll start part two of lecture 14 in the next video.